Good day, fellow learners. This is your mentor, Mentor Ray Gapus. Once again, welcome to my YouTube channel. And today I'd like to highlight one concept which I know would help you in your test preparations for your NCLEX RN test, okay? So let's talk about scarlet fever, okay? So here's a question. Why is scarlet fever called the second disease, okay? Why is that so? Because there are actually six disease conditions that are all manifested mainly by the presence of a rash. And we have first, second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth. Actually, what is considered as the first disease is your missiles, or otherwise known as rubiola or hard missiles or 14 days, 14 day missiles or morbili. It's caused by the missiles virus. The second disease is your scarlet fever or scarlatina. It's, called, it's actually caused by your streptococcus pyogenes or your group A streptococcal bacteria. Your third disease is your rubella or German measles or your three-day measles caused by your rubella virus. Your fourth disease is your philato dukes disease or Ritter's disease or staphylococcal scalded skin syndrome caused by your staphylococcus aureus. Your fifth disease before it was known to be erythema infectiosum, actually the experts ran out I, uh, historically, okay, the gossip was that the experts run out of the name. That's why they just simply called it fifth disease. Okay, but now they have relabeled it erythema infectiosum. It's caused by erythro parvovirus B19. Okay, and of course, your sixth disease, exanthem subitum or rashola or sudden rush or the three day fever caused by human herpes virus six or seven. Now, look at the difference. The three day missiles is your third disease and your three day fever is your sixth disease. But for this video, okay, we're gonna talk about scarlet fever or scarlatina or the second disease. So if you know before that you have a fifth disease, now you know who is first, who is second, third, fourth, and who is sixth, okay? Okay, but today we'll be talking about the second disease. Okay, so before we talk about the second disease or scarlet fever, I'd like to ask everyone to join us in this mission. Our goal is to provide free NCLEX RN application and review to 100 nurses to help us achieve this. Just watch and finish the ads in our videos. Thank you in advance for doing that. That's all you have to do. Just simply watch our videos and finish watching the ads too, okay? So here's another reminder. If you have any questions or concepts in mind which you may want me to cover in my future videos, please do send me your request or questions through this email, mentor.raygapus at gmail.com. Please do send in all your requests and messages pertaining to our YouTube channel in this email only because let's not crisscross with the other emails, okay? So that I would know that when I open this email, it's just gonna be your concerns related to the topics I covered for our YouTube channel. For those who have yet to subscribe to our YouTube channel, please do subscribe, Gapos Mentors, okay? And you would see that we have both short and long videos that deals with a specific concept, okay? Like EKG interpretation, both um, the pointers, just the pointers and a comprehensive discussion. And of course, your NCLEX are in pointers and insulin, which comes in several parts, okay? So for those of you who have yet to subscribe, please do subscribe our YouTube channel so that you'll be able to support more of our colleagues who are turning out to be very, very good scholars, okay, of our program. So let's begin with the functional concepts. Scarlet fever is an infection caused by a group A hemolytic streptococcal bacteria that is almost always accompanied by sore throat and high fever. High fever meaning 101 degrees Fahrenheit or 38.3 degrees centigrade or even higher. So the first thing in mind that you have to think about scarlet fever would be the presence of sore throat and high fever. So if a child is usually between five years old to 15 years old, would have sore throat and, and high fever, think about scarlet fever. But what really defines scarlet fever, okay? Take note, scarlet fever in infants and young children requires droplet plus standard precautions until 24 hours after initiation of effective antibiotic treatment. So scarlet fever is manifested by, remember the code RSF, presence of red rush and skin, red skin creases, or what we know as your patch lines. Now the rushes could actually start from the face, 
moving on to the trunk, and then the arms and the legs, okay? Now, you've noticed also that there are certain parts of the body, like the creases on the neck and the creases of the elbows, okay? The creases on the knees that becomes a little inflamed and becomes red, and the lines become more defined, and the lines now are called pascha lines, okay? Now, the strawberry tongue occurs at day four and five when the tongue that's usually covered with white, white patches eventually peels off, revealing now a shiny strawberry-like um, um, appearance of the tongue. So you have the strawberry tongue on day four or five of the condition. And of course, the flush face, reddened face, but around the mouth, there's usually a whitish space. So we call that circumoral pallor, okay? Which is characteristic of scarlet fever, remember R, SF, red rush and red skin creases or partial lines, strawberry tongue that occurs on the fourth or the fifth day of the condition or the infection and the flash face with circumoral pallor. Now, this is how the strawberry tongue looks like in scarlet fever. You have the tongue that's usually covered with white patches. Then eventually when the white patches peels off, it reveals the reddened strawberry-like um, texture of the tongue. Okay, you have like strawberry seeds in the tongue, right? Okay. Now the Russian scarlet fever that begins, please do take note on the face and look, there's all, there's a part around the lips that is whitish, we call that circumoral pallor, and then it affects the trunk and then the arms and the legs. So it looks like a sunburn, it feels like a sandpaper. It would usually be found on the face, the neck, the trunk, the arms, and the legs, and eventually it turns pale when you apply pressure on the rashes. So it lasts for about a week, and then after a week, it would be followed by peeling, or we call it medically as desquamation, okay? So the skin peels off, okay? Now, what are the different manifestations of scarlet fever? Remember the code FIND. So fever that's high with chills, it's approximately 101 degrees Fahrenheit or 38.3 degrees centigrade or higher. You have increased soreness and reddening in the throat with white or yellowish patches initially. Then when it peels off, then it reveals the strawberry colored tongue. Nausea and vomiting, enlarged and tender lymph nodes in the neck, okay? And difficulty swallowing, okay? Because of the inflammation of the mucosal linings in the throat. Okay, so scarlet fever facts, it's common in children between five to 15 years of age, okay? But it could, it could also affect other age groups. Complications can affect the kidneys. It could potentially lead to glomerulonephritis. So you have to assess for the presence of that, meaning the patient would have decolored urine, okay, um, edema, okay? Uh, puffy eyelids, which could be uh, associated with facial edema, okay? And then the patient would have elevated blood pressure. So that should ring a bell that the patient's having glomerulonephritis and it's developing a complication. Then tonsils, lungs, skin, the blood, the middle ear, and in rare instances, it could lead to rheumatic fever that affects the joints, the nervous system, and the heart. So potentially, if the patient had scarlet fever, it's not a far-fetched thing that eventually the patient would have mitral valve stenosis or mitral valve regurgitation. So the patient would have murmurs as a manifestation of these conditions, okay? Now, if the patient develops rheumatic fever, definitely they will have carditis or polyarthritis affecting the joints, subcutaneous nodules, erythema marginatum, and of course, abnormal movement in uh, associated with the central nervous system, the patient may develop chorea. Okay, now there's no vaccine for the condition at present, but basic hygiene practices like hand washing, covering the mouth and nose when sneezing, and not sharing eating utensils may help in the prevention of the spread of the disease. Now take note, for the diagnostic test, a throat swab is essential in collecting materials for diagnosis of the condition and treatment involves the use of antibiotics like penicillin and amoxicillin to treat the infection and ibuprofen and acetaminophen for fever. However, pay particular attention to the fact that that ibuprofen could be nephrotoxic. So for as so long as the patient has yet to develop a complication um, that has affected the kidneys, it's, also, it's always safe to administer the ibuprofen. But once a complication has affected the kidneys, then you'll have to refer that to the healthcare provider. Acetaminophen is hepatotoxic. So if the liver is already damaged, pay particular attention to the fact that acetaminophen may worsen that. Okay, and then of course provide comfort foods. We say comfort foods, warm soup could actually 
um, provide some comfort to the patient um, called treats. Actually, I came across a literature that says you can serve ice cream if there's a sore throat because it could potentially numb the area, okay? But um, that's one of the literatures I've read about um, comfort foods to be given in patients with scarlet fever with sore throat. But if you're asking my opinion, okay, I'd rather be concentrating my attention on the administration of warm soup, okay? So that's actually very, very important. Okay, next, penicillin or amoxicillin is the antibiotic of choice for scarlet fever. Now, remember, infectious conditions, either viral or bacterial, like for example, hepatitis B or hepatitis C, okay, or bacterial infection like um, strep throat, as well as chromosomal abnormalities like Down syndrome, even viral infections like chicken pox, can increase the risk for glomerulonephritis, and eventually the development of CKD, chronic kidney disease, okay? Now, having this functional concept in mind, let's try to use it to answer a sample question. Suppose you have this kind of question, which is syndromic in approach. A child with puffy eyes, swollen belly, ankles, feet, and legs, decolored urine, and elevated blood pressure has been admitted. What is difficult with this question is that you don't have a diagnosis, you are just given a group of signs and symptoms. That's why it's called syndromic approach. You have a syndrome. Now, what will this syndrome define? What condition does it define? So if you find the presence of puffy eyes, the color during an elevated blood pressure, that differentiates your acute glomerulonephritis from nephrotic syndrome. Because in nephrotic syndrome, although there's puffy eyes and swollen belly, ankles, feet, and legs, the urine in nephrotic syndrome is frothy and not the colored and the blood pressure in nephrotic syndrome could be normal or even decreased. So these two, the presence of T-colored urine and elevated blood pressure could be the group of symptoms that would define the presence of glomerulonephritis, which simply means the patient is already experiencing a complication. Now, which of the following data in child's history could be related to the manifestations exhibited by the child during admission? Let's go through it. What is difficult with this is that the options if you don't have a working knowledge of scarlet fever, it's very difficult to relate the options to the questions, okay? Is there any relationship between the presence of this syndrome, uh, of these signs and symptoms that define a syndrome to incomplete vaccination? That's actually a very, very broad concept. And say incomplete vaccination, it doesn't tell us the details. So we might skip that a moment. Previous diagnosis of scarlet fever. Okay, what did we say a while back? potentially scarlet fever could affect the kidneys. So could it potentially lead to glomerulonephritis? Yes, so we could consider that, but let's go through the other options. Born of a teenage mother, once again, is there a connection of being born to a teenage mother as to the pathology of the child? No clear connection at the moment, except that when you have a teenage mother, that mother who actually had multiple babies thereafter could be at more risk for cervical cancer, okay? Bladder trained beginning at age two years of age. Now take note, when you are toilet training a toddler, you always begin with bowel training at 15 to 18 months because sphincter control for the urina urinary bladder is not attained until the age of two. So bl being bladder trained beginning at age two is just appropriate. It's not something that could potentially lead to a condition as such as glomerulonephritis. So therefore the best answer, which has a potential connection to the syndrome being manifested by a child is admitted as presented in this question would be number two, previous diagnosis of scarlet fever. That's one tough question to answer, but this is mentor Ray saying, if you have a functional concept in mind, remember this, a functional concept a day, keeps your NCLEX RN fears away. So if you love this video, please don't forget to subscribe and hit the like and bell buttons. Then let's learn together. If you have some concepts in mind, which you may want me to cover in my future videos, send in your request to my email mentor.raygapos.com. 
And disclaimer, the instructional tool is created to enable students to develop their test taking skills. The question or question and answer or answers contained in this instructional video were patterned after the official publicly accessed samples from the RN test plan of the National Council of State Boards of Nursing. The discussions and rationale presented in the video are based on the lecturer's research and are meant to provide an explanation for the answer or answers to the question or questions that is or are presented. The lecturer makes no claim directly implied or otherwise that the rational discuss is officially endorsed by NCSBN. Once again, this is your mentor, Mentor Ray, saying thank you for joining and learning, okay, with me today. More learning to come in our future videos. So stick around and please don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell notification button for you to be able to join in our mission to enable at least 100 of our colleagues pass the NCLEX RN this year. So once again, see you in my, see you in my next video. Happy learning.